Welcome to our panel discussion on health, well being, and what's next. My name is Kim Bender, and I'm the executive director of the Healthcare Foundation of Northern Sonoma County. We believe every person, young and old, rich and poor, sick and healthy, deserves access to good health care close to home and access to necessary health related information, which is what this panel is about. We have a fantastic conversation planned for you today, but before we get to that, I want to go over a few housekeeping notes. This conversation is being recorded and will be posted to our website and to our social media channels. We'll reserve the second portion of the meet of this meeting, this conversation for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions at any point during the discussion using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please include your name and your location in your question. And we won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. And now I'm thrilled to hand this over to our moderator, Healthcare uh, Foundation board member, Laura Kimbrough. Dr. Kimbrough is a highly regarded expert with more than 20 years of experience in the field of women's health. Laura, please take it away. And thank you everyone for overcoming your Zoom exhaustion. We're very glad to have you here. Thanks, Laura. here to moderate this discussion among these um, panel experts. Today we're going to focus on what we as residents in Sonoma County need to be thinking about as shelter in place is lifted. We'll examine the new normal in our community and provide advice on how we all safely move forward together. So to get us started, I'm first going to um, introduce our four panelists. <clears throat> Dr. Derek, Gary Green is an infectious disease and HIV specialist at Sutter uh, Pacific Medical Foundation in Santa Rosa. In his early career, he worked as a public health officer in Wyoming and has subsequently been the chief of infectious disease at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Rosa before moving to Sutter Pacific last year. Sue Labby is the medical director of Alliance Medical Centers in both Healdsburg and Windsor. She has over 20 years experience in healthcare um, leadership and is really passionate about working with the medically underserved and committed to improving access to quality healthcare for all residents in, <clears throat> in Sonoma County. Then we have Senator Mike McGuire with us. He represents the second Senate district, which stretches from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. And Mike is the chair of the sub, uh, Senate Governance and Finance Committee and he sits on the Budget Committee, Transportation and Housing Committee, and on the Energy Committee. And then we also have Assembly Member Jim Wood, who was elected in 2014 and serves the people of California's second Assembly District, which also runs from the Oregon border along the California coast to Bodega Bay. And he's been a leader in um, passing legislation to protect and expand access to medical, dental, and mental health and as well as um, containing healthcare costs. So thank you all for being part of this discussion today. I'm going to ask each of you an opening question and set the stage for the discussion today. You'll um, each get three minutes and then we'll open the floor for audience questions. So Mike, uh, Mike the first question's for you. Can you help us understand how Governor Newsom's plan for reopening applies to Sonoma County? What do we need to know about the shelter in place restrictions and um, that are loosening today and what new programs have been put in place to support California residents? Well, good afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to be here with you and thank you to the foundation for their leadership through this pandemic, but also through some of our most challenging times for the fires. We are tremendously grateful. Uh, to the work that all of you have done. Let's uh, get right into the issue of what stage two means in regards to reopening our economy and what it will look like here in the weeks and months to come. So first and foremost, we wouldn't be at this point uh, being able to start reopening our economy safely and strategically if it wasn't for the sacrifice of tens of millions of Californians. Uh, there are so many uh, who are hurting right now uh, and what we know is the best thing for public health uh, is the worst thing for our economy. That said, due to a lack of vaccine or antibody testing, it's the best tool we have to be able to help slow the spread of the coronavirus. So here's where we're at in regards to stage two. Uh, it, we just opened up mom and pop retail, 
uh, as well as our manufacturing sector across California. That's as of today. Uh, so we're making some movement on this. Uh, so the bottom line is this. Uh, businesses should be working with their public health departments on protocols and best practices uh, to be able to keep their employees and customers safe. But I want to be candid. Stage two won't look like the normal that we have been used to or look like the normal from just eight weeks ago. There are going to be three stages to opening up. And right now, uh, here's what it's going to look like. Stage two in Sonoma County is open for mom and pop retail and curbside pickup. There is a version of stage two called stage two plus. Stage two plus is based off of a variety of factors, which I'd be happy to be able to get into, uh, but it may take a little longer than the three minutes. So I'll just say this. Uh, the County of Sonoma is ahead of the game. They've been working with their business community and we're working with our public health department in coordination. And I hope that we're going to be able to get to stage two plus here in the coming days to next week or two. In stage two, it's only going to be focused on that mom and pop retail as well as the manufacturing sector. What you won't see in stage two at this point, you're not going to see seated dining at restaurants. You're not going to see big public events. We're not going to be opening up uh, barber shops and salons. Those are too risky at this point. And candidly, large events uh, with large crowds will not be taking place now. And I want to be honest about it. We should not be expecting large events with large crowds for the months to come at a minimum through summer, potentially into early fall. Uh, base guidelines are being established by the state of California and every county can be above of those base guidelines, but no one can go below. I know this has been an incredibly tough time uh, and we still have challenges ahead, but we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'd be happy uh, to be able to get into further detail on what we could see here in the coming weeks and months uh, when we get into questions and answers. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Mike. All right, next question for Gary. Gary, what advice can you give to the residents of Sonoma County on how to stay healthy after shelter in place is lifted um, based on current scientific evidence? Also, what insights um, can we learn from other countries who have already opened up? Uh, thank you, Laura. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. Um, I think it's important for people to have perspective. And I think there's so much information coming out to the public and healthcare providers and to businesses that it's hard sometimes just to stop, pause, and realize that as we're moving sensibly to lifting some of the restrictions, that doesn't mean the pandemic is ending. We're in the very middle of the pandemic right now. We are at the surge of um, our numbers, and if you flatten the curve in your county, that doesn't mean that you're on the downhill side of the pandemic. We're right in the middle of it. So in the very midst, in the very middle of the pandemic, we're sensibly and strategically thinking about how best and how safely to lift some restrictions. And so that's why the public needs to know, we're not lifting restrictions because things are ending. We're lifting restrictions because we have to make sure that people are safe and the economy can move forward. So I think from a safety perspective and as a clinician, it's important for us to know that we need to follow the health officer's guidance very carefully. We're fortunate in this county to have a very talented health officer and they, the health department's working diligently 24 seven, we need to make sure that we don't do things that are not congruent with their recommendations. I think masking is very important. Social distancing is very important. I, um, I think that hand washing is absolutely imperative. Um, and I think the biggest thing for us now, as we're all feeling a little bit tired, is how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take care of our families? How do we reach out to those virtually who are alone at home or feel socially isolated? And so I know in the hospital, for example, we're learning how to take care of our colleagues, take care of one another, um, but yet still maintain that social distancing so we don't spread the viruses. As a physician, what I'm wor most worried about is that we do not let this get into the elderly or people who are frail because of medical conditions. So I wanna really preserve the safety of those most vulnerable. And unlike the flu, where the very young and the very old are at risk, with this virus, it's the very old that we worry about in those with comorbidities. Um, it's very hard.
it's very hard to, so, sorry about that, it's very hard to be on the, um, on the other side of uh, the patient's room when you see someone who's struggling to breathe and you think that this could have been prevented. So I think it's really important to know that whatever we do, all of our behaviors are either gonna help someone be safe or they're not gonna help someone be safe. And we can't let our own individual wants and needs um, ever um, supplant someone else's safety in our community. So I think Sonoma County has done a tremendous job. And I think one of the reasons we've done such a good job, we've been through two fires. We know how to pull together as a community and people here are very sensible. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Before we get to your question, I'm wondering if you could just um, tell the audience uh, briefly about Alliance Medical Center and the demographics of the patients that you serve. Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do so. Talking about Alliance and um, the amazing patients that we serve is one of my favorite things to do. Um, Alliance Medical Center, also known as AMC or Alianza, is a nonprofit federally qualified healthcare center and a safety net clinic. Um, we provide medical, dental, and behavioral health services to approximately 13,000 patients throughout Northern Sonoma County. That means that we currently care for one out of, out of every four residents here in Hillsburg and one out of every five residents in Windsor. Um, we serve a very culturally diverse yet economically challenged and vulnerable patient population that is primarily low income and either uninsured or underinsured. We believe that all members of the community have the right to quality health care services and for this reason we provide these services regardless of an individual's ability to pay. We aim to improve the health of our communities by reducing health disparities and eliminating socioeconomic barriers to seeking care. We have remained open throughout this pandemic as we are committed to doing everything we can to improve the health of the community that we serve. Great, thank you. So um, I'm wondering if you could share about what it's like to be practicing medicine right now and um, how you've had to change your practices and what challenges you're facing in the um, new normal of what we've got going on. Yeah, in a matter of weeks, we've had to radically change how we practice medicine. Um, we launched COVID-19 testing site and numerous COVID-19 triage protocols. Um, we are also providing the vast majority of our visits over the telephone or using a video platform. We are doing all of this while continuing to focus on reaching out to vulnerable patient populations who we know disproportionately suffer higher illnesses and mortality rates from COVID-19. During this time, health centers like ours are uniquely positioned to address the health disparities that this pandemic has made glaringly evident. Although we have received emergency funding that will help us to keep our doors open in the short term, in order to remain viable in the future, we need to prepare now for what the new normal will be. Um, the landscape of healthcare in a post-pandemic age will include the need to sustain our telemedicine program, the ability to successfully implement new procedures to minimize exposure risk, along with the capability to provide enrollment services to those members of the community who have found themselves newly unemployed and uninsured, and the capacity to provide on-site rapid testing for COVID-19. All of this um, requires a great deal of staff training, resources, and technical support to ensure everyone has the knowledge and tools needed to successfully adopt our new care delivery systems and workflows aimed at continuing to provide high quality care with minimal associated risk. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you for that information. So um, this last question now is for you, Jim. Um, and uh, you're going to be making laws and funding decisions that will affect us not just in this pandemic. What do you think you've learned and what things do you think we need to be doing from a legislative standpoint, specifically with healthcare legislation to be with, specifically with healthcare legislation to be positioned now and in the future? Well, it won't just be me. It'll be my partner, Senator McGuire. So let's get that. Let's get <laughs> right up front. So we work, we work together on a lot of these issues. So so I think this year you're going to see uh, a lot of things play out more through our budgeting process. Um, and uh, as we're still learning through this pandemic and learning what we may need to do going forward, uh, I don't know that you're going to see uh, a tremendous number of substantive bills because I think we're still gonna be learning. As we, look at, uh, as we look at some of the things that we need to be really focusing on, how do we, how do we protect some of our most vulnerable uh, in the community thinking 
uh, assisted living, thinking, uh, skilled nursing facilities, and those are those are areas where they've never really had to deal with things like this and and at all. And so we've got to be focused on that. Uh, you're going to see challenges in the budget. I mean, we heard yesterday a $54 billion hole in our budget. That's a significant hit. And so um, for, uh, for a lot of us, and especially those of us in smaller communities, more rural parts of the state, uh, we want to hang on to as much as we can and, and as much of the resources and services that we, we can. Um, and we know what happened during the recession a few, not that long ago, uh, seems like light years now, but uh, we've got to be really, uh, really cognizant of that to not lose ground. Um, so I, I think that for me, the things that I'm always looking for, because our, our communities are different throughout the state, is flexibility. I do not like one size fits all approaches to uh, things in the, you know, in the state. That usually means that our smaller communities uh, don't get the resources or they don't have the flexibility they need to make it work. So that is uh, first and foremost from uh, on my mind. The second part of that is making sure that our smaller communities get the resources they absolutely need and deserve. Uh, Senator McGuire and I teamed up and, uh, you know, asking that cities and counties below 500,000 uh, get some of that federal money that was sent in the CARES Act, uh, asking the governor for some of that. If you're a large city, uh, of, of which there are only six that are uh, in California that, uh, that meet that criteria, or one of the, I think, 12 counties in California, over 500,000, you're gonna get money directly from the US Treasury. But we're not sure if we're getting anything. And that's a real concern for us going forward. Mm -hmm. Investing in, in, in huge amounts of money and protecting public safety, um, protecting the people that, that live in our communities. And uh, we need to know that, that somebody's got our back in the future. So uh, those, are, those, are, those are challenges that we have uh, going forward. and. Uh, um, I think you'll see legislation, I think the most meaningful legislation will actually begin next year as we, as we really uh, totally understand, hopefully totally understand the nature um, of this and the impacts on our citizens. Great, um, thank you all so much. And thank you, Laura. Um, I've, we've been getting a lot of questions and we have over 300 people who've registered and are on this call. So I've, I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, and I think a segue from that last comment from Jim, um, and this is for both of you, Mike and Jim, Mar Maria from Healdsburg asks, the coronavirus crisis highlights the challenges many have when it comes to accessing and affording healthcare. Looking to the longer term, might the crisis be a catalyst for broad reform in how we deliver healthcare, including introducing Medicare for all in the state of California? Let's start with Mike and go to Jim after that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. And I want to take a moment to recognize uh, Assemblymember Wood. Uh, we work so well together. And I got to tell you, he has been such a leader as the chair of Assembly Health Committee. So I uh, always love being with him. I think that uh, on the issue of Medicare for All, uh, the legislature, along with the governor, has established a working group. It's a funded working group um, with appointees from both the legislature as well as the administration to be able to determine next steps for a potential Medicare for All uh, model here in California. There are some pretty significant questions that uh, are, we're doing a deep dive on right now. Um, how much is it gonna cost, number one? How are we gonna be able to get uh, the waivers that we need, especially three waivers that's worth uh, approximately 380 billion uh, from the Trump administration? I'll be candid. Uh, the Trump administration is not gonna do us any favors uh, at this point. Um, and we're gonna have to wait, everybody knock on wood, uh, for change administrations coming up in November. Um, and the, the other piece is that it's gonna be focusing on is how we realign our healthcare system uh, here in California under one department. Uh, the recommendations were gonna be due in July. Uh, that is now gonna be pushed back because of the virus. And the final uh, draft of their proposal was gonna be due next spring. Uh, would anticipate that is gonna be uh, pushed back as well because of this virus. But it's one of the most critical issues of our time. Uh, and it's something that we are committed to bringing forward with a data-driven approach. Assembly member, I don't know uh, your thoughts on on that working group. I know it's been so critical. It's been great to tag team on. Yeah, thank you so much, Senator. Um, the I actually actually sit on the working group, uh, yeah. and we had we had an initial meeting. Uh, we were then supposed to have another meeting, and then this broke out. Uh, yeah. Report coming. So, so the work continues. But I think that this uh, pandemic really highlights 
um, how disjointed our healthcare system is. And, and when you look at the ability, you know, all the different entities that are out in, in healthcare, um, a more coordinated uh, approach uh, with some central centralization of, of aspects of that could be really, really beneficial. Um, you have, uh, you know, not-for-profit, for-profit, um, you know, state run, you've got so many different uh, pieces of the puzzle here, but, but it, I think it really does highlight the, um, the challenges we face with our current system. If we are going to ultimately be successful with a Medicare for all system, it is going to mean retooling our workforce as well. Um, we're, we're grossly understaffed on so, in so many of, uh, parts of our workforce. Uh, our, our primary care providers are, uh, are, are smaller than they need to be. And in those countries that act, actually have a unified uh, centralized form of uh, health care provided for them, uh, the, the, key, the key difference between us and them is that two-thirds of those physicians are primary care doctors with one-third as specialists. And in this country, it's just the opposite. So we have to really focus on that early primary care, the intervention that we need uh, to, uh, to help to improve those, ultimately those health outcomes, which um, are better in, in those, those other countries. So our work is cut out for us. I don't believe California can really go it alone without federal support. Um, uh, Senator McGuire was absolutely right. This administration has already said they won't help us. And so we've got to find uh, uh, some patience, uh, but we can still be uh, laying the groundwork. We have some constitutional issues we need to explore and uh, in our own state. And, uh, but I think this pandemic points to the disjointed nature of our healthcare system. And I believe we can do a lot better. Thank you. Let's turn to the medical professionals for some questions that we're getting around. Um, I think this is for you, Gary. Um, as an infectious disease specialist, um, do you feel that we're ready to move to stage two? And, and I think you kind of covered this in your opening remarks, but is there anything else that you want to tell us about some of the latest things around um, a vaccine or the antiviral remdesivir? Well, I think as a medical community, we've learned a lot about the virus the disease and, uh, and treatment already. We know which treatments are starting to work and which treatments don't work. In fact, we also know which treatments can be, um, can be harmful. The most important thing as a medical doc is that whatever we try that's novel should be tried in a randomized controlled study. And one thing I think the medical community is feeling is this tremendous collaboration and sharing information. So in the study that we at Santa Rosa Center were a part of the compassionate use of IV remdesivir, is um, my colleagues that helped co-author that paper in the New England Journal, 179 different medical centers across 16 countries were involved and are involved with that study right now. So I think we're learning how to collaborate as a medical community and we're learning which treatments work, which treatments do not work. And we're very careful about, um, about approaching patients and knowing which demographics are the most vulnerable for severe disease. Great. Um, I, this one's for, for you, Sue. Um, how sh concerned, this is a question from Barbara in Healdsburg. How concerned should I be about going to the doctor? Um, so I think there's a lot of people asking themselves that question. And I think that as a medical community, we're going to have to do, take a lot of steps to really reassure folks that it is safe to come back out and, and see their doctors. Um, it also, we also have been able as kind of a silver lining throughout this to um, launch a lot of telehealth and telemedicine um, services that people can still continue to access care through. Um, so sheltering in place and social distancing does not mean that you have to put all of their medical issues on hold. Um, I really want our patients and the community as a whole to know that our medical providers are still here, both virtually and in person, to address their medical needs. Um, I get really worried that in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, people are sheltering in place and practicing social distancing, which is wonderful, um, but um, that's con I'm concerned that people who are experiencing potentially life-threatening conditions such as heart attacks or strokes may be delaying seeking medical attention out of fear of contracting the coronavirus. Um, and it's really important for people to understand um, that under no circumstances should any patient avoid going to the emergency room or calling 911 if they truly feel like they're experiencing a life threatening emergency. 
um, to specifically address kind of returning to those in clinic uh, visits, um, a lot has to be done. Um, and so we are gonna need to um, take proactive steps to educate our patients and the community about all of the changes being implemented to minimize the risk of exposure. Um, this includes changes in cleaning practices, changes in scheduling and registration, uh, changes in the physical layout of clinics, um, the expanded use of personal protective equipment as we start to see more patients in clinic, uh, screening everyone entering our clinics, and hopefully in the near future, the ability to do on-site rapid testing for coronavirus. Great, thank you. Sounds like go to your doctor if you need to. <laughs> um, let's see here. I, this one I think is for Mike. Approximately 30% of Sonoma County is Latinx and an estimated one in 10 workers is undocumented. Do you know the plan for distribution of the $150 million Newsom set aside for undocumented workers who have no access to other forms of relief, uh, such as the stimulus, stimulus money, unemployment, or Medi-Cal? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, California is the only state in the entire nation that is uh, focused on being able to provide some direct assistance for those who are undocumented. Uh, I think it is egregious that the federal government is not opening up uh, their unemployment share of dollars uh, to those who are undocumented. I think that we can all agree here in California, our diversity is who we are and it's what makes our community strong and economy thrive. On the specifics in regards to the program, uh, the state is gonna be contracting with nonprofits in each and every of the 58 counties to be able to um, provide direct assistance to those who are undocumented. The way it's gonna roll out is it'll be $500 per individual, $1,000 per family. And if we can be really honest about this, that is not nearly enough. It's a drop in the bucket. It won't cover your average month's rent here in Sonoma County. Uh, I think that is gonna be one of the issues, and I'll look to Sim uh, Member Wood on this as well, that um, we're gonna need to be able to grapple. There are millions of individuals in this state who are taxpayers and undocumented, and they have a right to be able to access benefits just like every other taxpayer. Uh, and that is something that we're gonna need to be able to focus on as we move into May, which is budget season for us. And we're gonna adopt a second budget in August uh, that will uh, be our true budget after we have our deferred uh, income tax returns coming in July 15th. So this is gonna be something that we're gonna be very focused in on as we move forward uh, here into the spring and summer months. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go to a kind of a light question that someone has asked. Why are dog groomers, and I think maybe, maybe Gary or maybe Jim can answer this one, why are dog groomers not allowed to be opened in this next stage, or, or is that the case? Well, go ahead, Gary. the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think the, the guiding principle for most of our decisions with businesses is that people just don't crowd, and that there's not an opportunity for people to be in close proximity, especially for long periods of time. For example, waiting in line for someone to finish um, in a dog grooming business. So anytime that there would be um, close contact and we don't want to encourage um, people from especially all uh, age groups to be mixing and mingling. Um, and I also think that, you know, dogs are, the people who own dogs and pets are very social and this is not the time to be in close proximity in a socializing fashion with people that you otherwise wouldn't be close to, so. Gotcha, thanks. Okay, here's an interesting one, um, kind of on the subject of um, opening the economy. So I leave that sort of to, to you, Jim and, and Mike. Um, as and this is from Terry, and I'm not sure where Terry is from. As a healthcare and public health professional, I am concerned that calls to open the economy soon ignore the likely eventuality we will have to close the economy again for a longer time when the second wave is even more deadly and possibly hospitals are overrun. Are you feeling considerable pressure from the business community to go to stage three before we should? So let's, I'll ask first Jim and then Mike, but um, if you can keep your answers short because we have a lot of questions, thanks. Sure, there's obviously there's a tremendous amount of pressure to open up the, the economy. And I think that you, as, you, as we move forward, you're going to see, uh, as we do open up, you're going to see more cases. And uh, I think the key thing is that, you know, we have, we still should be social distancing. We should still be wearing masks. We need to be washing our hands. We need to be disinfecting surfaces. And those are things that we didn't do as much prior to this. And so 
So that will be critical to us um, in, in helping to not um, have a huge number of cases. So all those behaviors we've been doing now, we're gonna carry with us for, for quite a while and we need to practice those um, uh, every single day. Thank you, Mike? I'll, I'll be uh, brief. Look, I think the bottom line is, um, I think all of us are hearing from uh, folks who are in the business community and if we're honest, um, so many folks are hurting. And at the same time though, uh, especially here in California, we can't do what Texas have done is, uh, or Georgia has rapidly reopened their economy. They're seeing record number of individuals who are now positive uh, in tests. So here's what I think that we need to continue to focus in on to make sure that we keep the public safe. Number one, we need to continue to implement an aggressive contact tracing program. Uh, we have to continue to expand testing. In fact, uh, we have two new testing sites here uh, state-sponsored testing sites in Sonoma County. We're, we're going to be seeing uh, those expanded here in the next few weeks. And I think the other piece is we have to make sure that we keep our hosp hospital capacity expanded. Those 500 beds uh, at Sonoma State, they're not going to go away anytime soon. We are far from being out of the woods, uh, and we need to ensure that we have the overflow need to be able to meet any potential demand here in the coming uh, months. And by the way, uh, and look to the doctor on this, we're at least a year and a half, most likely from uh, a vaccine being widespread, which is why we need to continue to test, uh, become very aggressive in contact tracing, keep those uh, hospital beds, those re that redundancy within the system, uh, and of course, implement stringent uh, social distancing standards, cleanliness standards, and masking standards within local businesses. Great, thank you. Um, Gary, this one's for you from Donna and Eddie in Healdsburg. Um, depending on who you talk to, I've heard this virus has mutated anywhere from eight to 20 times. Does that play into the validity of the antibody tests that are being offered? Oh, that's a really good question, a very scientific question. So um, this is an RNA virus, just like influenza is an RNA virus. And RNA viruses mutate all the time. And so we expect this virus to slowly mutate, or the word we use in, in influenza season, we expect it to drift. But as the virus does mutate and change, most of those mutations kill the virus off. They're not helpful to the virus. And one out of a thousand, one out of, out of a million mutations allows the virus to maybe be more fit, maybe be more um, transmissible. Most of the time in evolution, when a virus mutates in a host, it becomes less dangerous. We'll have to watch this virus. Already we know there are eight different strains of the virus, three different clades. Uh, there was a lot of uh, talk in the New York Times recently about this virus. And um, we're following a specific marker mutation on the spike of the virus to make sure that the vaccine target will be as effective if the virus does mutate at that location. Uh, the serologic test for this, we don't know a lot about the serologic test. The blood test for this has been um, Many companies are, are, de are developing that, and we don't know how useful, how sensitive, and how specific the blood tests are. What we do know is that the nasal swab, a nasal swab that detects the virus, is remarkably sensitive. And if you were using a technique called PCR, that technique is 95% or better in its sensitivity for the virus. So that's the good news. Great. So many great questions coming in. I'm just scanning them for the next one. Just a moment. Um, Let's see here. Um, a, just a really specific question is um, how many um, COVID patients are at currently at Sutter Hospital um, asked by Bradley? And just a quick, quick answer on that one, Gary. Yeah, well, actually, um, because of patient privacy, it's important to know that um, we can't give specific numbers, but I can tell you that all of the county hospitals have experienced this and all of the county hospitals are sharing information on how to best deal with this um, with this virus and so as we gather medical experience with the virus as we share that information we'll be able to collaborate better and we'll be able to use medications like the investigational remdesivir antiviral we're using at Sutter right now great okay this is an interesting one from peter and cloverdale um and this is i think for you mike and I'll give to you again, Sue, shortly. Um, is there a plan to monitor increasing infections as we move out of shelter in place? For example, 
I have heard that Alameda County is looking into monitoring waste treatment plants for increased levels of virus indicators as a means of determining whether we need to go back into shelter in place. Have you heard of anything um, about that? You know, I, I'll be honest, I have not heard of any issues in regards to wastewater treatment plants. What I can say is that there is uh, going to be an aggressive approach to contact tracing, uh, being able to hunt down uh, who that individual may have talked to or come in contact with um, who is positive for the coronavirus. So you're going to see a significant effort by counties in the state to be able to bring in uh, additional, literally hundreds of contact tracers throughout uh, Northern California. And I think the other piece that we need to talk about is we still have huge gaps in our testing system. Uh, we're very lucky to be able to have two testing sites here in Sonoma County. It's by far not enough. But between Sonoma County, uh, you can drive four hours to Eureka to get to the next state-sponsored testing site. And that's a huge concern for Assemblymember Wood and I, especially for rural California. There are 700,000 Californians that still are well uh, beyond that 60 minute limit that the governor set to be between testing sites. So uh, I know we're talking about contact tracing and we're talking about how to, how to ensure that that doesn't spread, but if we do not get widespread testing in big cities and small, uh, I'm very concerned about this virus here in the months to come. Great, thank you. Um, this is one that I'm gonna ask Jim and that Sue, you could also weigh in on. Um, this is again from Terry. Um, thank you, Assemblyman Wood, for championing the role of nurse practitioners. The need is greater than ever given the crisis. Might the governor consider an executive order to allow nurse practitioners to work independently as they do in many other states to help rural communities and inner city areas where access is difficult uh, to enable nurse practitioners who typically practice with low income and vulnerable communities? So, I'd love for Jim to give an answer, and then I'd love to hear Sue's perspective on that. I would love that to happen, quite frankly. Um, the governor gave the Department of Consumer Affairs broad discretion to uh, address uh, scope of practice issues. So far, the Department of Consumer Affairs has chosen not to do that. Um, I have a bill, AB 890, that's in the Senate now. Um, they passed the, out of the Assembly on a vote of 61 to 1. Uh, to actually lift the um, supervision requirements from nurse practitioners uh, under very specific training and experience. So this is uh, this this is a would be the strictest such law in the country should it be enacted. But I think it is going to be really important. I think we're going to see more and more need for primary care. We are already struggling in our in our areas in California. Northern California is one of the areas that is has struggled will continue to struggle with primary care um, it doesn't appear that we'll see an executive order at this point which i'm disappointed in but um but i think that uh you know as the bill moves forward uh, my hope is that we actually can get that across the line and and, and actually be successful there i do want to point out um as kind of this a, as a follow-up to what uh, senator mcguire was talking about regarding testing and that's another uh, sort of a scope issue that we call uh, in the legislature. There are 47,000 pharmacists in this country. There are 6,300 pharmacies. And on average, you know, people live, uh, not in our rural areas necessarily, but on average, people live within five, five miles of a pharmacy to their house. In 28 other states, pharmacists are doing testing. Think about that. We're not doing that. And um, in New York, they're actually using EMTs to go door to door to do testing. So if we really want, and I believe that testing will be the key uh, to monitoring and, and, and catching those outbreaks early, testing and then contact tracing. But in our rural areas, to be able to have testing at a pharmacy uh, where they can already give you a vaccination, they can do a variety of other things, would be a huge bonus for, uh, for rural California and any that is underserved. So. Um, that is under discussion right now with the administration, and my hope is that that actually rolls out. Great. Love to hear from Sue and Laura about um, the nurse practitioner question, if you would answer that. Thanks. Sue? 
Sure. Um, so as we all know that there's a nationwide shortage of primary care providers, um, and especially in California, um, over the past couple of years here at Alliance, I have really worked hard to recruit providers because um, we had a shortage as well. Um, but anything that we can do to increase the access to quality primary care for the constituents of California and across the nation, we should be doing. So putting in further barriers to being able to access that care only inhibits the, the patient's ability to get the care that they need. So I do want to thank um, Assemblyman Wood for his support of AB 890 um, and definitely um, think that it would only benefit Californians. Thank you. Yeah, especially, Laura? I was just going to say, especially rurally, especially mm -hmm. here in rural, um, you know, rural, Arizona, Arizona, rural California, that is um, especially important. So I agree with Sue on that. Um, Dr. Green, do you have any comment on that? No, I know that Sutter is pretty active in working with um, our advanced practice clinicians like yeah. nurse practitioners. In fact, in, in the Sutter facility, they're actually part of our shareholders. And so we value them as, uh, as colleagues. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's a good question from an anonymous person. I think uh, this goes to Mike. Uh, how are you handling, how are we as a society handling social distancing for those incarcerated individuals and how are we keeping inmates safe? Uh, great question. So uh, we've had uh, two prisons, uh, Chino uh, in, in particular down south, where we've had pretty significant outbreaks. Uh, so uh, the way that has been handled, uh, just like um, we're all doing, uh, inmates were in their cells uh, for the vast majority of the day and the evening. Um, they were all provided masks, uh, and there has been testing uh, conducted. Um, the peak of that virus, particularly uh, within the Chino facility, was approximately three weeks ago. Um, and uh, that is a, a significant concern. The, the two closest prisons to us, San Quentin and San Rafael, uh, is working directly with Marin County Department of Public Health, as well as Kaiser and Marin General, uh, on inmate care uh, and on testing. And then, of course, up in Pelican Bay uh, in Crescent City. Uh, it, it remains a, a great concern. Uh, for the state, um, and there is a whole testing task force that is built in within the California Department of Corrections, uh, who is focused on this each and every day, along with Secretary Diaz, who both uh, Senator Member Wood and I have been on the phone with, because the other challenge that we've been seeing is, especially coming out of Chino, uh, positive cases uh, for individuals. They have, former inmates have been released and put back into the community uh, who are positive. So that's a whole nother uh, layer of work that we've been working with the secretary on to ensure that doesn't continue to happen and how we, as when people are released uh, for early release, that they continue to uh, remain in, um, in a hotel room for 14 days. But it's been a significant effort uh, by the state to be able to quell the outbreak, especially within the Chino facility. Thank you. Um, I'm reminded of just jumping back to our previous question about nurse practitioners that the Healthcare Foundation has a program to develop um, and give scholarship to nurse practitioners to stay in our community because we really want to develop that pipeline. So it's a, it's a super important program that we've championed. Um, this question I'm going to put out there and just let, maybe you guys can raise, any of you can raise your hand to answer this one. It, it's sort of a broad question around, um, you know, we in Sonoma County have experienced multiple traumatic events over the last few years. Mental health in our community continues to be impacted. Does that worry you? And how can we be more prepared as we approach the next fire season? Does anyone want to answer that question? Jim, we'll, we'll, do, take, we'll answer multiple. I'll take a quick. I'll take a quick shot at it. I think that that is a that is an un. Uh, an under, uh, under discussed issue, uh, quite frankly. Um, people who have behavioral health challenges uh, isolated in their homes uh, for long periods of time without their normal support networks are, are, are going to be huge problems. And um, also, you know, some of our older, older folks that have been isolated. My mom lives in an assisted living facility up in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, she has been in her room for 21 days, um, not, not, with, with only the access is to having somebody leave food outside of her door. That can't be healthy for people in the long run. And so 
I think we're going to need to be spending more effort on, on mental behavioral health. Fortunately, we have the ability to do some telehealth now. It's not quite the same as an in-person visit, but um, it's a connection that, that can really work for people. But it is, it is uh, in many ways, it's kind of an un, un, unseen epidemic of challenges that we're facing. And, and I think I fear, it, I fear it grows, quite frankly. Um, and we really have to focus on that. Thank you. Anyone else like to answer that one too? <laughs> Um, I think that this really highlights the need to be able to sustain our current telemedicine practices. I know that um, our behavioral health providers are doing 100% telemedicine at this point um, through video, through telephone, um, based on the patient's preference. Um, but I'm actually was speaking with the behavioral health department recently and talking about how excited I am that we can expand the number of patients that we can reach if we are able to continue doing telemedicine. And I think the need is going to be so great that you can access behavioral health providers from all different regions and send them to where the need is by using telemedicine. So I really hope that this really highlights the need to continue the telemedicine and get the folks with the expertise to those that need it most. Laura? Also, I was going to say too, as a, as a primary care physician, it's something that I think is important for us to start to include. I mean, not that we don't ask about that already, but it's more important now, more important than ever. <laughs> to really ask about how people are doing and really really question that so that we can get them to the providers that they need. Just, just letting them know that we're there and that we're interested and we realize that it can be, that it's a problem right now. Right. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the Healthcare Foundation has made mental health a big, um, huge commitment to what, our, what where our resources are going. And we have the mental health talent pipeline and um, we've, um, we're doing mental health in schools and really trying to focus on addressing mental health sort of as a result of the fires, but now of course it's um, related to this new crisis. So thank you for answering that. Um, this is a question from Sue, and I think um, we can go to Mike or Jim on this. Hospitals all over the nation are struggling fin financially because of the drop in revenues associated with restrictions. Our own local hospital in Healdsburg has seen volumes drop across the board in ER and OR and clinics, but Fortunately, we haven't seen the surge that we were anticipating in COVID-19 cases. Um, Mike or Jim, what role does the state play in ensuring that the hospital continues to operate um, going forward? Uh, and how does that fit into the context of the rest of the country? Who wants Jim, to go first? Mike. Sim, you want to tag team on this one? So look, uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to uh, Chairwoman Gore for all of her work and to the uh, incredible staff team at uh, Hillsburg District Hospital, along with Alliance for what they have been doing uh, throughout this crisis. Um, they are truly heroic. Uh, and let's be honest, uh, they have canceled all their elective surgeries. Uh, that's the bread and butter of a hospital. Um, and just like hospitals across this nation, uh, they are facing significant economic challenges. So through the Federal CARES Act legislation, approximately uh, 1.3 million um, has been invested with um, the, the hospital. It's not nearly enough, by the way, uh, and there's going to need to be much more as we move forward. So on the state side, I just want to be honest about it. Uh, there will most likely be some assistance coming from the state for hospitals, but it's going to be much more limited to what the federal government will actually be able to do. Uh, and the reason being, and not trying to be flip about this, is the federal government can continue to print money, literally. Uh, the state, uh, by our constitution, uh, is stuck within our financial boundaries. We have $17 billion left out of $21 billion in our rainy day fund. Uh, as you heard Assemblyman Member Wood say earlier, we're facing a $54 billion shortfall. So while there will most likely be some assistance coming up in uh, the next few months where I think, and again, not at all trying to, to punt, but simply being candid, uh, I think the vast majority of assistance is going to need to come from the federal government and how we can continue to, for example, make telehealth uh, more permanent uh, for reimbursement is going to be huge for small district hospitals, FQHCs, as well as rural health clinics. Senator Member Wood, uh, please chime in on this. Yeah, thank you, Senator. And, and I, I, I don't think we can hit hard enough on the telehealth part of it. It is it has become really prominent right now in what we're doing, but it is um, it is under sort of uh, some of it is some of it is potentially permanent, some of it is not. So we really need to codify that into law. Yeah. 
actually do that. Um, as far as the hospital assistance for hospitals, the California Hospital Association recently sent a letter to the governor, I think it was this week, asking for a billion dollars in, in assistance. And uh, um, I don't see a billion dollars coming to hospitals, but I do see something coming to hospitals and it is, it is, it is significant. Um, whatever we get ultimately needs to have flexibility and not, not, not a lot of strings attached to it. Um, we, do, we want people to spend the money appropriately, but we want there to be enough flexibility so that you can't, you're not, your, your hands are not tied and you can't use the resources appropriately. So we have a critical access hospital in Healdsburg. That means it's 25 beds or less. Um, and so we are, are, are a little bit more challenged in, in how, as far as what we can do for volume, but we're critical to the community and uh, mm -hmm. other critical access hospitals, uh, critical to our communities. So uh, one thing that uh, I am asking the governor for is to consider um, there are, um, there is a program for seismic retrofitting of hospitals. Um, it needs to be done. Um, and there are some deadlines that are coming up in, in the next 10 years. Um, but right now, hospitals are not going to be able to afford to do that, especially smaller uh, district hospitals uh, are not going to be able to do that. So I'm asking that we consider pushing those deadlines out a little bit. Um, I'd mm -hmm. rather see us have a hospital than not have a hospital. And uh, this uh, forcing uh, additional expenditures on top of hospitals now, I think, would be a, a catastrophe on a catastrophe. We can't afford that right now. Thank you, Jim. Um, Here's a question that I think you might be able to answer, Gary. It's from Herman. Um, his question is, reports throughout the nation are reporting that people of color are showing much higher testing positive. In Sonoma County, we have 30% Latino community population. When will Sonoma County begin letting the community know what is the percentage of how the Latino community is affected? It's a big concern. Is there, is there, is there, um, Demographic data associated with infection rates available? I think, yeah, I think at the public health lab, we're going to have demographic data pretty soon. One of the things that um, health officer Mays did, Dr. Mays did, it was very smart. To increase our testing capability in the county, she collaborated with UCSF's lab. And so much of our testing is being done at UCSF, which mm -hmm. allows us to maintain capacity at the public health lab to test patients from hospitals and other clinics. So, but because she allowed for our increased capacity with that collaboration, now we have to work with UCSF to understand where the data is. So at the mm -hmm. epidemiologic level at the health department, it's gonna take them a little bit more time to sort through two different laboratories data on patients and their demographics. We will have that information in Sonoma County pretty soon. I know they're working day and night with, the, with that information and the demographics can be very important. I think what we're gonna learn is that in some cultures, like what happened with Italy, is that multi-generations live together under one roof, and that exposes multi-generations to a virus. We've seen that happen. We know that when the virus is spread in the community, it's usually spread within a family first. And so some um, ethnic groups, like, like my own, half of our family is Mexican, we are multi-generational as well. So we're gonna learn some important things, not just based on economics, not just based on, um, on social norms, we're also gonna learn some, some nuances based on um, some of our living conditions as well. Great, well, we are at our last five minutes of this great conversation, and there are so many other questions that people have asked, so we're not gonna be able to get to on many, many subjects, but we are gonna do a quick lightning round of questions for all the panelists, including Laura, um, and I'm just gonna start. So this is a, a quick quest set of five questions, if you would answer with one sentence each, please. Um, first, what was the hardest thing about sheltering a place for you personally? And let's start with Laura, for you. Not, see, not seeing my grandkids. Okay, Mike. Not seeing family. Yeah, Jim. Same. Yeah, how about you, Gary? Actually, it was when I was quarantined uh, during a testing period when I came down with symptoms and I was worried about the virus. So not seeing my family at all and, and staying in a room, you know. How about you, Sue? Um, well, I'd say I love being around people and having those social human connections. So for that reason, the mandate for social distancing really drained my usual source of energy renewal. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, being on Zoom all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, next thing is uh, for all of you, 
Have you binge watched any TV shows? And if yes, anything you're willing to admit? Laura? Yeah, I'm not a TV binge watcher. Okay. Mike? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, two of them. Uh, Hunters and Narcos. Got it. How about you, Jim? Uh, Ozark, uh, Jack Ryan, the, the Jack Ryan series. Oh. Uh, Henry Bosch, the, the Bosch series. So. Okay. Great. How about you, Gary? Um, all the Marvel movies with my kids. Oh, nice. <laughs> How about you, Sue? Uh, unfortunately, I think I need to do a little more binge watching. Mostly what I binge on right now is news coverage on COVID-19. So. <laughs> right. I watched the first couple of, uh, um, episodes of, uh, um, seasons rather, of High Maintenance on HBO, which was great. Okay, next question is, will you ever shake hands again? Laura. Hmm. Why? When you can butt, you can bump arms. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mike. At the appropriate time, yes, I miss it, and uh, also the uh, the occasional hug as well. That's it's been hard not to do either. Hugs, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Jen? I, I absolutely will. I had shoulder surgery in uh, in December, and That's so right. we're doing these elbow bumps. That hurts. So, <laughs> or do I actually some other interaction at some point? I'm doing fine now, but but it didn't. It wasn't so fun a couple months ago. Gary, how about you? Infectious disease? Are you going to shake hands again? What are you going to do? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that handshake is so important to the healing art of medicine. I think that absolutely has to come back just with a lot more hand washing. Nice. Yeah. How about you, Sue? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually thinking this might be the catalyst of people greeting each other in a different way. I know that the elbow bump feels really weird and awkward and the wave at close distance seems weird, but we've been kind of trying out different things here, sort of in a, now we're bowing a little bit, um, kind of a respectful greeting without having to, um, to touch each other. Um, so I don't know, time will tell as far as, you know, how this all plays out. Great. Um, can you all share what the best thing you've cooked in during shelter in place, cooked at home? Like Laura? Strawberry shortcake. Mm, yum. How about you, Mike? I will be honest. We are terrible cooks. Uh, so uh, we have tried many things. Uh, they have not turned out all that great, um, but uh, we have mastered polenta. <laughs> oh, great. That's nice. Okay, how about you, Jim? Uh, ribs. I made a really great rack of ribs a couple nice. of weeks ago. Tonight we're having hanger steak with an Asian marinade, barbecued corn, and a beautiful green salad. Wow. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, I wish I could come over. Okay, Gary, how about you? Homey gnocchi. Oh. Gnocchi. Mm. Hey, Sue, how about you? So I have to be honest, I've been working a lot. So um, I've been doing my best to support our local restaurants and doing a lot of takeout. Um, but I am looking forward to enjoying a Zoom dinner with my in-laws this weekend for their 50th wedding anniversary. Mm. Nice. Okay, um, let's see, final question. What are you looking forward to most as shelter in place restrictions are listed? Laura. Seeing more of my friends, you know, just being social, I think, being able to feel comfortable, social, six feet away, but just feeling more comfortable doing that. Nice. Thank you. Mike? I think two things. One, uh, we're, we're really tight with uh, our family, so really, it, it's been hard, right? And it's also awkward being in the front yard, uh, saying hi from distance. <laughs> and uh, I will be honest, I'm a Starbucks fiend. And I have not been in eight weeks. So uh, looking forward to uh, heading back to that. How about you, Jim? Uh, the opportunity to see more of my son. Uh, yeah. And uh, also, uh, I like to go out to dinner. My partner and I, she and I love to go out to dinner. Um, I like to go out with him. And um, as much as I love to cook, um, I really like it when we go to a nice place and have someone else, someone else do the cooking. Thanks. Yeah. Gary? Uh, I think it's going to be taking my family out to Starks for a nice ribeye dinner and a nice bottle of St. Francis Merlot. Nice. How about you, Sue? Um, definitely visiting friends and family and being able to hug folks again. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, I can't wait to hug my kids. Haven't hugged them. Well, thank you, panelists, and thank you, Zoom audience from San Francisco to Ukiah, Marin, Sonoma, Napa, and Lake Counties. Thank you to everyone who contributed to our Healthcare Foundation 
emergency fund, we met our match this week and continue to raise money to provide immediate assistance to our most vulnerable community members. Our website is healthcarefoundation.net if you'd like to contribute. In the meantime, I heard go to your doctor. So that's what I'm gonna do. Right. Stay tuned, we hope to do more panel discussions like this on vital topics related to our collective health and well-being. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye.